Uh, hello, and I guess good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Farah Fakdaman, and as Dr. Najafi has already mentioned, uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Tom Bray University in Finland, and uh, I mainly work on video compression and more generally on uh, multimedia. <laughs> More specifically, we work on energy efficient solutions for multimedia and energy efficient solutions for uh, video compression. So uh, today uh, I want to talk to you also about this issue and uh, just to give you an introduction about this. The goal of today is not going to be go to going into too much detail about the video compression as it would be boring if you go into too much details. Uh, but uh, the main goal, I think, is going to be to to give you an idea and an understanding of what's going on inside this field. What is video compression? Why we do it? What are the main challenges? And what are some of the solutions that uh, have been proposed for this type of problems? So we will go through a very short introduction about video compression. Then I will talk a little bit about uh, complexity reduction techniques for video compression, and we will consider some applications that just reducing the complexity may not be enough, and we want to adjust the complexity or control the complexity. And uh, after this, we will talk a bit about bandwidth and the scenarios that the bandwidth limitation is limiting us, and we want to uh, optimize that by some perceptual optimization. We will talk about this, and finally, we will. Uh, take a look at what we think that may be the future of the spin. So I think we all know that video technology today is a big part of our lives. We cannot perhaps live without it. And uh, the recent pandemic have, uh, may have uh, even uh, made it for more hard highlight. So uh, right now for education, for watching TV, uh, TV streams for using the social media, almost for any application, most of the applications that we use today, uh, video or image are part of it. So uh, to give you an idea that, of uh, what that implies in terms of uh, the pressure on the network, uh, you should know that almost 70% up to 80% of the uh, today's internet traffic is video. And by video, we don't mean uh, downloading files or uploading files. We are just talking about the live video, video on demand, this type of applications. So naturally, this puts a lot of pressure on network, and we want to mitigate for that. But unfortunately, as time goes by, it even becomes more prominent, and it becomes a bigger part of the internet. And the reason for that, perhaps, is the widespread use of the social medias and the availability of the mobile devices. Right now, uh, anyone with a camera can be a reporter. It used to be at the time that uh, just the guys at the biggest studios had some uh, high quality uh, device to capture video and to transmit it over the broadcasting network. But right now, networks are available, devices are available, so everyone is actually distributing the video content. So that's one of, way of, the, one of the reasons why it's spreading still so much. And uh, Emerging applications do not show any decline in it. Uh, everything we hear about AI, about uh, 8K video streaming, about uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, all of these applications actually require much more benefits of the internet. So we know that in future the situation is going to be even worse. Naturally, to cope with this sort of uh, high bandwidth application, we come up with uh, uh, new standards every few years to be able to compress the video even higher. So what does it mean to compress the video? Uh, basically, we want to reduce the extra amount of information which is there to be able to store and communicate the bare minimum amount of information, the bare minimum number of bits which is required to reconstruct an image. How do we do that? Uh, we often say that the video content or multimedia content in general is quite redundant. And if you think about video as multiple frames, multiple images, uh, you may understand what, the, what I mean. You have uh, frames, you have images uh, after every few milliseconds that look quite similar to each other. So there's a lot of redundant information. There. Yeah, so what we mean by getting rid of the extra information is that we don't want to transmit all this information just to do a video call. We want to perhaps transmit just the changes in the video. This is in the temporal domain as time goes by, so by frames, 
And even inside one, one frame, uh, it's not like all the information is necessary. The pixels that come next to each other are carrying redundant information. Basically, it means that uh, you don't have random information. This information is correlated. So we can somehow transform this information into another domain to represent that with fewer number of bits. Just to give you an idea, this may be how a uh, normal and generic uh, encoder may look like. Now, it looks uh, unnecessarily detailed, so I'm just going to skip to a lot of parts. Uh, this is how uh, generally we encode the video. First, we will start by uh, dividing the frames into a smaller parts. We usually uh, process or even compress video or image in block manner. So we want to be dealing with small blocks and do the same operation on top of all of them until we process or compress all of it. After dividing this videos into uh, some things we call CTU or coding units, what we do is that we try to predict that as we have talked. We want to get rid of the redundant information and that means uh, doing some operations that we call motion estimation, which is basically the same uh, operation that you use to estimate the motion and get the changes between the frames to be able not to send all the frames. And intra prediction, which is somehow the same thing, but means inside one picture, intra frame, intra picture estimation, meaning that we want to estimate some parts of the image given the information from the previous parts of the image. After finishing these operations, we usually pass whatever remaining information, meaning the residuals, through some transformations and quantizations, which I haven't shown here. And finally, we will pass everything into the uh, next parts of the uh, encoder, which do add the headers and encode everything, every single symbol and every single bit with something called variable length uh, encoders. You can imagine some uh, basic encoders such as Hoffman that you may be uh, familiar with. And finally, this becomes your bit stream. So this is the basic flow of the encode. Now, what's a bit problematic in this flow is that there are so many decisions to make, like for finding the motion estimations, which was this block here, whatever it is, uh, you usually have a big search space that you have to search and find the best motion vectors. Now, the decoder part is usually standardized. It means that the decoding process is somehow deterministic, but when it comes to encoder, there's no standard encoders. You just have to comply with the beta stream requirements and you can search the space uh, whichever you want, which means that you could do an exhaustive search, a full search and find the best encoding parameters, or you could just guess and somehow make a lower quality or a video that uh, corresponds to a higher bit rate. Uh, these are some of the decisions that we have to make in a compression and these are the things that make it quite expensive in terms of computational complexity. The first one is the motion estimation, which means that you have to compare consecutive frames and try to come up with the best motions that uh, find the best motions that correspond to these uh, frames after each other. The next part, another part, is called the intra prediction. Intra prediction means that given that uh, some parts of the image or some parts of the frame are already in hand you may be able to predict the next parts, meaning perhaps the next line, the next row of the image, given the previous information. And we do that by some sort of uh, directional filters that you can see here. Like in the famous standard of HEVC or H.265, we have 35 directions that you could go for doing this intro prediction. Now, it means that if you want to find the best parameters, you have to search all these options. So you have to somehow repeat the encoding operation 35 times and compare each of them together to find which one corresponds to the fewer number of bits. So which one is the best and finally choosing that one as your final winner. And you could imagine that this is quite expensive. The other part is block partitioning. So as I mentioned, we usually want to uh, partition the frames into a smaller blocks and deal with the blocks. But the new generation of standards uh, usually provide a wide range of sizes for these blocks, some about, uh, uh, from 128 pixels in 128 pixels down to 44 pixels. 
And again, the only way that you can find the best parameter is by doing the exhaustive search and testing all these different sizes and all these combinations that could come with size with the sizes. Uh, usually these partitioning uh, structures are something like this, that you have a very big block and you have the option of dividing it into four subblocks or keeping it as a whole. And if you went with the partitioning, now you have again this decision in the smaller domain. So it means that you have somehow like a quadri partitioning decision that you have to make. So you could imagine that there is a huge number of uh, combinations that you could test, and this again adds to the complexity. So with this introduction, you could imagine that one of the biggest challenges with video compression is the high processing power. It is one of the most power consuming uh, applications that you could have. And it could correspond to the video decoding, which is watching the movies and actually play back in the video, or even worse when it comes to capturing the video, which corresponds to the video encoding. Uh, as a whole, we, we always say that the video industry, and this of course doesn't mean just the video encoding and decoding as a whole, it uh, accounts for 1% of the global greenhouse gas emission, which is similar to a country like Spain. And this may also give you some idea why this is a very important uh, challenge to be tackled. So other challenges that I skipped are the high bandwidth. You usually need at least five megabits, uh, megabits per second for watching a good uh, streaming of video, or it can uh, easily go up to 20, 30, or 40 megabits per second when it comes to some specific types of content, such as gaming, which is interactive video. And I will be talking a little bit about that too. And the other one is the low delay and real-time applications, such as this video call that you're having. In a video call, which is a bit interactive, you cannot tolerate a certain amount of uh, uh, delay. And uh, usually for a good video call, you need something below 200 milliseconds. And for some more interactive applications, such as gaming, even sometimes, depending on the genre of the game, you need uh, 100 milliseconds or even lower than that. And uh, sometimes you need to even be able to adjust the complexity such that you can change this requirement because the requirement actually changes. So uh, this is one of our works that we have uh, conducted uh, extensive uh, experiments on HEVC and VVC to compare them. This was uh, perhaps like two years ago, that the standard of BBC, which is the newest uh, video compression standard, just was released, and we wanted to uh, get a good idea of it, that uh, how much complexity does it add. So if you compare them, you can see that in some configurations, like the low delay configuration and the random access configurations, which usually correspond to uh, the online uh, content, uh, like uh, video calling or the video on demand, uh, the newest standard is five times and seven times more complex than the previous one. And for the very high quality, which is the old intra, which means that we are uh, perhaps compressing for archiving or some very high quality applications, the situation is even worse, up to 30, 31 times uh, higher comp coding complexity compared to the previous one, which all uh, means the same thing that I said, the complexity is too much and we need some complexity reduction techniques to get rid of this extra complexity. Now, what we mean by complexity reduction is actually doing some sort of smart decision making. We know that we have a big uh, decision space and what we want to do is to choose more smartly. We don't want to do the exhaustive search. We don't want to be looking at all the uh, available options. We just want to do some very smart and some very uh, simple pre-processing and be able to tell which ones are gonna be the most probable ones. So meaning that we want to uh, spend less complexity, less processing power to achieve somehow similar uh, quality. And by doing this, we know that uh, there's a good chance that we may not get the best uh, scenario. We may not be able to uh, provide the best quality or the best bit rate that the uh, standard offers. And we should be cool with it. This is the trade-off that we are making. But what we are aiming for is getting a little bit of the, uh, losing a little bit of the compression efficiency and gaining a lot of complexity efficiency. 
So let's dive into a few of these solutions and take a good look at some of them. This is probably one of the earliest solutions that we have made. And uh, this corresponds to fast intro prediction. Now, I think I have already shown an image of the uh, intro prediction and what it looks like. Uh, here, you can get a better idea. These are some uh, texture, uh, small blocks of the uh, frames that you can see. And you can see how they correspond to certain modes in all these available options that we have for intro prediction, like this. Uh, whatever it is, it may be a small branch of a tree, uh, looks something like this. So because of the texture and the direction of the texture, it corresponds best to this mode number six, which corresponds to a similar angle. Or for this texture, which is mostly almost vertical, we can see that after searching all these modes, which are uh, 35 modes, uh, we can see that mode number 25, which is almost vertical, corresponds best to this one. So it comes to the fact that can you do a very quick analyze of the texture? Can you come up with some sort of very quick uh, image processing uh, solution that can tell me what is the edge direction in this image? If I can do that, this can give me a good idea and I can narrow down the search space that I'm doing. We have also two other modes here, mode planner and DC, which are somehow uh, an averaging operations. We do not uh, encode with direction. And they usually correspond to textures like this, textures that are a bit blurry, textures that are a bit flat and not without, uh, not with too much details, or actual textures that have too much detail. So there are so many contradicting edges that it's impossible to find a dominant edge direction. So this is one of our earliest solutions. We employed the dual tree complex wavelet transform, which is an extension of uh, discrete wavelet transforms that operates in several directions. So one of the main differences with discrete uh, wavelet transform is that it's uh, working in complex domain, meaning that uh, all the frequencies do not necessarily need to be double-sided and symmetric. So uh, this implies somehow that uh, if you have this, you can discriminate between positive edges and negative edges, like the positive 45 degrees and negative 45 degrees. And this gives us more discrimination, and that's one of the reasons that we have used this. So uh, Without going into too much details, if this is one of the uh, synthetic input that we give to this dual tree complex wavelet transform, these are the decomposition that we get out of this wavelet, uh, wavelet transform. So it will decompose it into vertical directions, horizontal directions, and diagonal directions. And by analyzing the energy inside each of these subbands, we can somehow estimate what is the direction of the image or actually what is the main energy direction of the image which sometimes corresponds to the best direction of the image and by having this of course we can limit the search space and gain some complexity reduction as i said that was one of our earliest solutions later we have thought about it is it absolutely necessary to be using uh, such sophisticated image processing tool we are always interested in using the most simple things possible possible so that has led us to going and experimenting a little bit that can we just take the variance of the pixels can we do the most simple operations such as getting the variance of the pixels now if you take the variance of the pixel in extra uh, domain uh, and wild domain and uh, compare them you could also come up with the main direction of the image but unfortunately that doesn't work and we have tried so many uh, small solutions and they didn't work. And the reason is that there's so much noise inside the image. And these sophisticated tools know how to get rid of those uh, noises and get you the edges. So it made us think again, is there something else inside the codec itself that we could use? And there was. As I uh, already talked about it, uh, for the uh, intro prediction, we have so many filters. And one of these filters is actually the planar filter, which have, uh, I have shown you here, which corresponds to the blur or flat region. So the basic idea is like this. Imagine that I take a photo of you, and I want to have your sharp features of this image. One solution could be that I can deliberately blur your image, and then imagine I have your blurred image, and I have your uh, original image, and I can put them together and subtract them from each other. What is left is actually your sharp features, right? Because one of them is blurred and one of them is the full image that has all the information. So 
We are trying to do the same thing here. We pass the image through the planar filter, which will give you the flat and uniform parts of the image. And then we subtract it from the original image. What we are left with, which is highlighted in this image, is the main edges that you could use. And this image over this, what we call it the residual residual of the planar mode, if we analyze this with very simple operations such as variance, this could actually give you quite accurate estimation of the edge. And the amazing thing about this is that we do not need to operate any of this. These are already part of the encoding process. If you have an encoder, any SUVC encoder or UVC encoder, planar is a big part of it. And taking the planar of each uh, block and computing the residual is already part of the uh, encoding process. So we can just zoom in and take one of these values and uh, analyze it with some very basic operation and be able to estimate the edges. Another thing that we have noticed is that there are so many uh, statistical information inside the encoder that we could use. We have a unit named CAPAC, which corresponds to the entropy coding in the in, uh, encoder. Basically, it tries to model the probability of each symbol being present into this email and image and being able to encode them the best way. So this camera keeps a table of the context of the image, which uh, corresponds to the probability of things happening. And by analyzing them, we were also, again, uh, able to come up with some sort of very basic rules that if they happen, we don't need to continue the search anymore. Like uh, we have noticed that if the probability of these two specific modes that I've mentioned, the DC and planar, if the probability of these are higher then the earlier steps of the search, you can just cut the search out and you don't need to go further. You can just skip the rest. And these are going to be the best modes at the end and you can just already uh, announce them as the best and be done with that. Uh, Dr. Fohat, it seems yes. like- you, Go, go ahead, seems, please. Yes, sir. It seems like you, you have been using the word prediction a lot. So that seems like a good candidate for this type of work would be machine learning. Is there any yes. work that, yeah, so maybe you can address that if there's some work that has been done using machine learning to do mm -hmm. some of the mm -hmm. predictions. Yeah, thank you. Sure, sure, sure. Actually, we have done some of the machine learning too, and I will be uh, talking about it. Sure. Uh, yes, you are actually right on time. This is the uh, first lecture, the first uh, slide that I will get into the machine learning. Now, when it comes to machine learning, and absolutely, you're right, uh, prediction, naturally, when you hear it, you think about machine learning. This is one of the best ways that you could predict something. Uh, but when it comes to reducing the complexity, we, we should be quite careful about choosing the algorithms that we use for learning. And the reason is obvious that we don't want to add too much overhead. There are already so many works out there for this very same problem, which is fast intro coding, and for many other related problems, fast uh, motion estimation, fast block partitioning, and many other things that use CNN, that use quite sophisticated uh, machine learning tools. And uh, as you have noticed, uh, we are already not quite happy even about using sophisticated uh, image processing tools, because we don't want to add too much unnecessary uh, overheads. So in this work, which is one of our latest works, we have thought about it again. What is there already inside the encoder that we could use? We like to use machine learning and we do do it, but we don't want to be using something as heavy as CNN. It, it feels to me actually like uh, using uh, a big hammer just to opening your can of soap. It shouldn't be like that. You, you can, if you think about it, and if you get into the application, then you can always find better features, small features, some smart features that could be uh, handcrafted quite easily. And that's what we did here. Uh, as you may be familiar, and I think I have mentioned that quite briefly, we have some transformation in, available inside the encoding operations too. And the DCT or the discrete cosine transform is one of them, which is a quite a strong tool, which is already part of the encoding and you cannot have an encoder without it. So all the information that you uh, generate are going to be processed by this DCT to go to into the frequency domain. And then those information without going into further detail are going to be encoded. So why not using this DCT for analyzing? And again, this is one of those scenarios where 
this applying this DCT is already part of the encoding process. So by analyzing the output, uh, we can come up with some sort of features, handcrafted features, not the sort of uh, automated features that you would get from a CNN. And we also use some other parts of the information, which are the information, statistical information coming from previously encoded logs. And we would use them as two different modalities to try to reduce the search space. Now we will get into this part. We try to uh, handcraft this feature. The number of the features may be a bit too much. So we try to use some sort of uh, feature reduction techniques to get into a very small number of features. I think 15 features. And then we use very, very lightweight uh, structure, such as MLPs, multi-layer perceptrons, to learn how to decide the coding decision. So uh, this is actually how the output of NDCT would look like. This is a visualization that we sometimes use to show it, which means that if you have an image of 18.8 and a block box, image that has 18 8 pixels and you process it with the DCT, you will end up having something like this, which is the matrix actually. The number here corresponds to the DC value, meaning zero frequency. And the further you go from this side, you will uh, get uh, the values, coefficients corresponding to higher uh, frequencies in X domain. And the same goes into the Y domain. So these values actually correspond to the type of the texture that you have. So you can imagine that it, it already can give you a large amount of information about what your picture looks like and how you should be treated. Treating it. Using this output, we handcraft some features that I'm not going to uh, go into the details of that. Uh, if you want, you can ask me or you can of course read it later. Uh, and finally, after performing some sort of uh, image uh, feature uh, reduction techniques, we will end up having 15, image, 15 uh, features that correspond to the best edges of this uh, image. So this is the first modality that we will pass to one of our uh, machine learning models. We have another modality, which uh, also can be used to reduce the complexity, which is the uh, statistical information that comes from the previously coded uh, blocks. So if you have a block here, X, there's a huge chance that this block looks somehow similar to the previously coded blocks. So you can just try to get these four blocks, the information from them, and try to learn a model by them. So uh, this is another source of information that we use. But uh, these two sources of information are actually quite different. The first one is something that could be global. You could use it to train one model, and this single model could somehow give you uh, a very good uh, prediction for all your videos. But for this one, for the second one, uh, because the information is quite limited and you are taking the information from your neighbors, there's a good chance that if you use it in an offline manner, you will end up drifting from the reality. So in a sense, you have uh, some modes, some parameters which are dominant, and if you keep predicting that dominant thing, you will end up having just that dominant thing. So this is very important to do this sort of uh, prediction in an online way. And uh, we are lucky because the information is quite uh, small and the number of parameters that we design for our model is quite small. This is just 25 uh, perceptrons in one layer that we use for this prediction. So having these two sources of information, we train two different predictors. The first one here is the offline one. The second one is an online one. And each of these actually could be used to accelerate the encoding uh, operation. But we want to actually combine them. And that's what we did. We combine them in a bimodal learning way, such that the output of both these predictors is passed to another network, which learns how to get the best out of these two and give you the final result, which is the final probability for each of these modes happening. This is how it looks like. If we take a look at the uh, training curves, we have the number of epochs here, and uh, this is just for uh, one example for one of our videos. If you look at it, this is the offline curve, which is uh, a bit higher than the other two. When we have the online one, online one is a bit lower, so it learns better. But as I told you, uh, it shouldn't fool us because uh, it can easily lead to some drifting from the best parts. Uh, but if you uh, join them together and do it in a bimodal way, you can see that you can actually bypass and surpass both of them and become uh, the best solution. And you can see this in the accuracy in finding the best mode that we have here. The offline 
for different sizes of blocks. Usually it corresponds to this number. The online is a bit better. And by joining them together, you will get a mixed model or a bimodal model, which can easily uh, improve the offline version by 5%, 6%, 7%, uh, correspond to very good values, which are uh, like 88% accuracy or 98% accuracy. Now, of course, in this sort of application, the accuracy is not the final thing. We want that to actually work in the domain of the application, which is the bit rate we will get and which is the quality that we will get. I have just put here the average result to uh, comply with the limited space that I have. And you can see that by this mixed version, we can reduce the required time for encoding by 24%. So 24% reduction in the cost of increasing the bit rate by 1.75. This BD rate or Gutenberg delta rate is a measure that we use to uh, quantify how much more bit rate do you need in your specific encoder to provide the same kind of quality as the bit rate. So this means that to get the same quality as the best encoder, which is the baseline encoder that uses the uh, exhaustive search, we will need to have 1.7% more bit rate, which is a really small number. So this is kind of a good trade-off to get 24, uh, 24%, 25% less processing power and just increasing the bit rate by less than 2%. Now, something that we really like about this paper is the exact thing that I was trying to uh, convey during my talk, that we don't need a huge uh, overhead to have this, this sort of thing. Our mixed model only has 15 plus four features and only have 150 parameters compared to some of our uh, other techniques that we see, not, not our techniques, but uh, other people's techniques, which use the CNN or sophisticated signal processing based model, which we also have some uh, works in this. We could see that we don't have a lot of parameters and we don't have a lot of the overhead, our method is quite fast and the overhead in the whole encoding time is just 0.2% for the mix and for the offline it's even smaller because it doesn't have any uh, online training. For some of these CNN best applications, you can see that they could easily go up to like 10%, 15% or even 33% of overhead because, well, of course, CNNs are quite expensive. And another thing about them is that uh, to be able to get a fast decision from CNN, you probably need a GPU, and GPUs are not always available on all devices, right? Okay. We also have some solutions in other problems related to fast encoding, like fast motion estimation, which we also use some uh, signal processing tools to solve them. I'm not going to go into details and uh, you could uh, read about them or you could ask them, ask me about them if you want later. Uh, but just let me get into the second part of my talk, which is the video applications with varying power and timing. Now, uh, this could be a couple of applications that correspond to this type of uh, requirements. And one of them could be the cloud gaming or even in mobile SOCs where the processing power changes and the level of your battery changes and you may be forced to uh, change the preset on the computer to survive for a longer time. But one of the most prominent one is probably cloud gaming. Now, cloud gaming is a, a rather uh, relatively a new application of multimedia where you don't have the game on your machine and you don't even have very high quality graphic cards or sophisticated hardware on your computer. All you do is that you subscribe to uh some sort of service you buy the service not buying the game and uh, the game actually plays on the cloud as the, as the name suggests and you will receive a encoded video stream of the game now you will react to the game of course with your controller and this reaction is going to be sent back to the server the game continues to play and again you will uh, keep receiving this video so this is a quite interactive uh, application. And for this kind of interactive applications, if something changes, perhaps the network condition becomes a bit worse, your deadlines could not be met unless you make some sort of sacrifice. And one of the few operations that you could actually sacrifice are the video coding, because the video decoding, as I told you already, is a bit more deterministic. The playback time is like that. Network is something outside your control property. It's a, it's a bit controllable, and we also have some solutions now to how to control it. But when you fail to control it, 
there's, there's so much you can do. So one of the good candidates that you could use is your video coding. That's one of the reasons that we always want to have adjustable uh, complexity at our encoder side. It means that we want to be able to provide the encoding at any desired time. If I'm given 100% of my processing power or my deadline, I want to be able to provide my best into that time. If I'm given only half my uh, processing power, half my best processing power, or half the normal deadline, I want to be still able to provide whatever I can with that limited power. So we also have two solutions for this. The first solution, okay, we need to have uh, a good understanding of the cost benefit trade off in this sort of problems. So that's why the first thing we did was a, a parallel optimization. Uh, we have so many different parameters, we have so many different number of uh, modes that we could choose. Uh, and uh, of course, choosing any of these things would also uh, affect the quality of the compression, which is the number of bits that you will end up having. So to have a better understanding of these, we performed a quite extensive exploration with uh, more than 1,500 configurations. And here's a visualization of this that you could see. And we found the Pareto frontiers of this optimization, which at the end correspond to just a few of the best modes given any particular limitation. So by having this, we have designed a controller that could look like this. Uh, for any uh, image or any video that comes into this encoder and any target time that you are given, what we will do is that first we will uh, encode the first frame and then give an idea of the required time. And then we will compare the time that we have spent so far per frame with the deadline that we are given. And by comparing these two, we will come into a ratio which corresponds to the fact that uh, if we are behind the schedule or we are actually ahead of the schedule. So we could actually use more time or more processing power to provide a better quality. So by having this index, we will uh, take a look at the lookup table and what's inside this lookup table is actually the best of these uh, configurations that we have chosen. So by knowing that what is the current configuration and knowing that perhaps I'm 20% uh, behind the schedule, I know that I have to reduce the processing power the complexity by 20%, and this will give me the next uh, configuration into this lookup table. And that's how I uh, keep track of the time and uh, perform this operation within the deadline. So this is one of the curves that we have for one of our videos that you could see that by choosing the uh, desired uh, limitation, uh, we can almost comply with it. This sort of variations are actually quite low, and you can see that the time error is actually a very small number, uh, less than 0.1%. And this is the uh, image of the configuration index, which is used for uh, encoding this sort of videos. So you could see that even though the time here is almost constant, or here is almost constant, the configuration is not. Sometimes we will uh, end up uh, falling a bit behind, so we have to choose another configuration. Sometimes it's the other way around. So we have to come and go between these different configurations to uh, sort of guarantee the final deadline. And uh, this solution is able to uh, provide the encoding from 100% of the time to 50% of the time. And this is the uh, compression efficiency that we will get. This is the timing error that we almost always accomplish getting, but this is the uh, BD rate, meaning the extra bit rate that we will need. For the 90% deadline, it's very small, less than 0.1%. Uh, For 80%, it's again very small. For 70%, it starts to write a little bit, 2% more uh bit rate to get this sort of time for 60 percent and 50 percent you see that it rises quite rapidly so at the end of the uh, time the, for the 50 percent uh, we almost end up increasing the bit rate by 10 percent which is quite considerable but this is of course the limit of the method and this is the minimum time that we could get using this sort of uh technique so to improve this we have decided to change the knob that we use. For the previous solution, what we did is that we were trying to 
limit the number of intro modes that we would use. For, so for one blocks, we may decide that you can just uh, search for four or five of the best uh, modes. For another one, you may limit it to two or three. Uh, but as the intro prediction has a limited effect on the overall complexity, and there are other other tasks that have even more uh, effect on it, we decided to change our uh, problem. So instead of deciding the best intro uh, prediction mode, we decided to choose for the partition, which corresponds to sometimes even 70% or 80% of the uh, processing time. Now, uh, you may already consider that the intro prediction and the motion estimation are already inside this operation. So this, this is like an outer loop to all those operations, deciding the best uh, block size and of course within that block size uh, doing all the other operations. So as you can see different parts of the image and different parts of the block could use different sizes of the block like for this uh, flat and homogeneous regions we use usually bigger sizes for these parts which have too much details we use very small blocks and this is all decided by doing the exhaustive search uh, searching uh, and encoding with all the different possibilities and ultimately deciding the best ones. So to solve this problem, we could treat it as a classification task. Divide a block into smaller blocks or keep it as the bigger block. And we could use some sort of classifier, something like the SVM, the support vector machine, to decide this. But one problem is that this task is not so easily uh, dividable, meaning that you cannot have a perfect classification. And there are some uh, situations that the, the, the difference between dividing or not dividing is so small that it's so, so difficult to model this test into a classification test. Uh, one of the solutions that we may come up for this is to use two hyperplanes, two classification, two classifiers. One of them corresponding to only one of the classes, the other one uh, corresponding to the other test. So this way, we may even divide it better. For this part of the plane, I know that these are stars. For this part, I know that these are circles. For the middle part, I leave them be. I do not accelerate these parts, right? So I do not, in my case, uh, stop the stop breaking the bigger blocks, or I do not go into further details, meaning that I will perform the uh, exhaustive search for this sort of application. So the problem still with uh, either of these approaches is that they are not flexible. They are just a deterministic uh, solution. So what we want to do is to have flexibility. We want to be able to spend more processing power when we have it to get a better result and limit our processing power when we don't have it. So that's why we came up with this solution. Instead of just having one uh, classifier, we will measure the distance to the decision point instead of just considering it as a threshold, as a limit. So it means that uh, I can change this threshold. So in this case, if I have this much processing power, I will choose my threshold here. And for the uh, for this space, I know the decision. For this space, I know the decision. For the middle part, I decide to do the exhaustive step. If I have more processing power, I will even consider removing this threshold from the uh, decision line. Meaning that ultimately, what we want to do is to be able to provide a decision with a high confidence. And we know that the closer you get to this decision line, your confidence is lower. You have probably like a 50-50% chance, right? And the further you are from it, you have a, a high uh, confidence. Like here, probably the probability is close to one that these uh, dots uh, belong to the class of the star. So that's what we do. Uh, having this in, in mind and with this motivation, we want to find the best decision points, the best thresholds that correspond to the best points and the highest uh, accuracy. Uh, and at the same time, it uh, satisfies the timing constraint. So we want to have the highest confidence in decision making, and we at this at the same time we want to comply with the constraint. So this is formulated into uh, uh, optimization problem like this, and by solving this, we can get the best result. So this is how it looks like. 
with this solution, because we are using the CPU partitioning or block partitioning, we get to have a bigger range. So we can encode with 100% of the required time up to down to 20% of the time. And these are some of the example images that we get. And this is a nice scenario where we reduce the available uh, processing power online and you could see how this encoder is working. And at, at each time that we reduce it from 100% to 80%, you can see that it immediately corresponds and uh, gets to the new deadline and uh, same goes for all the other levels. Now, for the 100%, if you look at it, you can see that the it's quite distributed between the larger uh, blocks and the smaller blocks. For the 60%, if you look at it, it looks pretty much the same as this one. It is still, uh, it's still uh, reducing the processing power by 40%, but it's still like here, uh, look that we have this sort of detailed block here, we have this sort of detailed block, and at the middle part, we are using larger blocks. When it gets to the lower part, like 20%, we barely have enough processing power just to be able to search for one or two operations and decide the best between them. So it ends up limiting the decision space too much. And here you can, you can see that for most of the blocks, either a 32 and 32 or a 16 and 16 block is used. And most of the other blocks probably are not even checked because we didn't have enough processing power to do that. We are just happy to be able to deliver with the 20%. And this, of course, affects the quality of encoding, the compression ratio, and for extension, the quality. So this is a magnified part that you can see. It looks quite nice, the 60% almost quite, uh, looks quite nice and uh, almost similar to this one. But for the 20%, you can see that somewhere like around these shoelaces, you can see some noise, something like a ringing effect, which is the effect of having too much time not to choose the best uh, configurations. Let me sp speed up a little bit and talk a bit about perceptual optimization. This was so far uh, just about uh, complexity, but uh, the complexity is not the only limitation. And in many applications, we cannot just afford the number of bits that is required to encode it with the best quality. So one of them being the cloud gaming. What we need to do is to use whatever technique that we know to reduce the number of bits and reduce the uh, bit rate of the video without the viewer understanding that this corresponds to a lower quality. This is called something as perceptual video calling, meaning that we want to deliberately actually reduce the quality, but we want to do it somehow, like in some regions, that you would not uh, normally look at them or you would not be able to tool tell the difference because we know that the human perception system is not perfect. So uh, before going into that, let's take a quick look at the structure of the eye that we have here. This is, again, unnecessarily detailed. We don't need to all, know all the details. Just the fact that this is your eye and you have something like a window, your pupil that the light comes in, the reflected light from the object comes in, and goes through this lens and is reflected somewhere here at the back of your eye that we call the fovea, which is the home to your uh, photoreceptors. And here, uh, your photocells somehow react to this light and form the kind of information that your brain will later process. So this information is transmitted, uh, transmitted to the brain and the brain processes that, and that's how we visualize things. That's how we see. So. All we want to see here is in to concentrate into this part, which is the phobia, which is the center of our uh, visual system, and look at the cells that we have there. We have two types of cells named uh, rods and cones that correspond to different things. We don't want to get into the details of them. Just the fact that somewhere around the center of your eye, their density is the highest. And if you go around by 20% this side or that side, you will end up having them reduced. So this means that the highest level of vision, the best quality, best resolution, if you will, is at the center of your attention. This means that if you're looking at somewhere, you're looking at it as a quite nice detail, but all the other areas, you don't see it that well. And of course, this is quite intuitive and we know it. But what would happen if we could model it, if we could know where you are looking at? So by knowing that where you are looking at, I could deliberately reduce the quality of all the other parts. That's what we call the region of interest coding or ROI-based coding. One of the best applications for this is actually gaming because uh, you are so engaged into the game that you would not look at other parts. The one example could be 
uh, some of these football games that you guys may be familiar with. Uh, and usually the crowd has a very bad quality. They look like cartoon, but you would never understand them because you're all the time concentrating on the ball, concentrating on the goal, and you would not look into the ground, uh, into the crowd, right? So and that's actually where we went for cloud gaming, which is one of the most demanding uh, applications of uh, this sort of region of interest coding. What we did is that we uh, we had one of these very cool devices named uh, 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 eye tracking device. I forgot the name. So these eye tracking devices could be installed on your monitor, and while you are playing, it could actually look at your eyes and tell me where you are looking and give me the data later. So by having this, we have collected a big data set that uh, consists of the video of the game and where all of these players are looking at. And we have been able to model this information and this is the flow that we follow. We first collected the, the eye tracking data set, then we clustered these gazes because of course you know that every person has a little bit of different uh, gazing pattern. So we had to collect them and cluster them into similar ones. And we noticed that these patterns uh, are quite similar between people with different, uh, with the same skill of uh, gaming. It means that for the beginners, for the intermediates, and for the experts, the pattern quite corresponds to a similar pattern. And you could see it here. Now, this is a game that which is a little bit simple because we needed the game to be open source. And the game is uh, one of those ones that you have to jump off uh, to avoid some of the obstacles and try to dive to get rid of the someone that shoots you. So it's a little bit of a simple game. And here is the attention of one example of our beginners. You could see that they are so afraid and they are so unfamiliar with the game that they are always just looking at the main character and just one step ahead just to make sure that they are jumping right on time. For the intermediate, they get a bit more comfortable around the game. So they end up looking everywhere around. You could see that this pattern is quite open uh, against this one, which is very narrow, and the guy is just looking at this side. Again, for the experts, which are the guys that know how to collect the points, they know very efficiently where to look. They don't just look at here, they keep looking here because they want to jump at the right time, but they know also to look forward, to know in advance which of the obstacles are coming, and look at this part, which corresponds to one specific uh, obstacle in the game that starts shooting them, and they have to know in advance just to jump in time. So uh, you can see that their uh, clusters are quite different, but between the members of the same group, they look quite the same. So we end up clustering them the same way and having this sort of mask to know where to guide the beats, where to put the big, the bigger number of beats and where to put the good quality and degrade the quality on the all, all the other parts. And by doing this and analyzing the results, we have actually seen that uh, we can end up uh, reducing the bit rate by, I think, uh, around 15% without any of our players noticing that something has changed. We could do that or either we could use the, uh, this extra bit into increasing the quality. So we could either increase the quality for those specific and uh, more important part, or we could reduce the number of bits for all the other. Same kind of techniques are used uh, for uh, performing another type of perceptual optimization. Now, another thing that we need to know about the perception system of human is that we do not see in uh, very quite nice and smooth lines. This is not the quality line that we could imagine. The quality that we perceive is somehow like a step function, like a quantized level of uh, levels that we would see. And we call this like the just noticeable distortion. This means that there is a certain threshold of distortions that you would be able to tell. And anything before that, if I reduce the quality, you would not be able to see it. And that's very important because it tells us uh, the exact point, the exact distortion point that I could impose on the image or on the video without you even being uh, able to tell that. So that's what we did. And uh, we used, uh, again, a machine learning technique. Uh, I think uh, with this paper, we used uh, SVR which is the regression part of the SVM, to predict the best point for using for the compression. I'm trying to speed up a little bit because I think my time is almost up. We extended this into a block level uh, algorithm, 
because we know that each different part of the video could correspond to a different texture and different limitations. And by doing this, we, uh, we actually made available the first JMD-based method that is able to give you the quality level corresponding to each of the blocks. And uh, that was one of the best work that we have done so far, I think. So let me skip. Uh, uh, Hassan, do I have any time or the time is over? If you can wrap it up in uh, okay. Okay. one or two I, minutes, I will, I will that would be perfect. Wrap, wrap it yeah. up in two minutes. Okay. Yeah. So these are some of the results. I'm just going to skip quite quickly, but this is how it looks. Basically, we try to uh, find the best regions that you would look at. This corresponds to the region of interest in this image, and these blue ones correspond to another uh, layer of the region of interest, which are less important, but is still more important than the rest of them. And we will try to uh, assign the best quality for each of these. And uh, you could probably see the difference here, like for the best uh, part and the most important part, this is uh, decoded with the first level perceivable to human, which if you compare these two, you probably won't be able to see much difference. But for this one, which is outside this region of interest, the quality is quite uh, obvious that has been degraded. Now, just allow me to talk just one minute or two minutes about uh, what's coming next. So these were some things that nowadays, perhaps from two years ago, we started calling them tra traditional video compression methods. And the reason is that we are going more into machine learning and more into deep learning. Uh, the new generation of the compression techniques, which are called learned compressions, which are using uh deep learning models basically either to replace one of the components into that uh, pipeline that i've shown you or uh hopefully to replace it whole so somehow uh end-to-end -end compression technique meaning that we have a structure like this like an autoencoder if you have seen previously that you will give an image to it or a video to it and it will compress it into a small code board this code board is your pit stream and if you give it to a similar uh structure you could reconstruct it into a whole image and that's your decoder you could now later after uh, after training you could divide them into an encoder and a decoder now the main problem with this which actually uh, brings me to my uh, research here is the computational complexity and it is much higher than what we had so far in compression in encoding it's like 10 times the compression of HEVC for the decoding, it's much higher. It's in the order of 100 or even, even a few hundred times of the HEVC, which is very bad news because so far we have been trying so hard to keeping the complexity at the encoder side such that you would have the high complexity one time and for the thousands of guys that watch the video, they wouldn't uh, suffer from the high complexity. So this is one of the uh, main future topics that we will be investigating here at Tom Bray University. And another one is Compression for machines. Nowadays, we have so many different visual sensors in different applications, such as smart cities, such as autonomous driving, that are capturing video or images. And this is not even for you. You are not supposed to watch it. Uh, this is all supposed to be transmitted to a server and analyzed by a server just to be able to make visual decisions. So that's why we are thinking that uh, all the algorithms that we have developed so far for standards are not useful for this. These have been optimized based on human perception, which doesn't correspond necessarily to uh, machine perception. So the goal here is to develop a new standard and the standardization also uh, started quite recently at the MPEG, then maybe the name of video compression for machine, DCM, which is going to be the next standard to develop algorithms and standards that can improve the compression ratio dramatically and lower the complexity also because we have so many of the sensors at the IoT nodes and operating on battery. So with this said, I think that's it. And this is the end of my talk. And these are the references that I have been using. Once again, thank you very much, Hassan. And thank you very much, everyone, for paying attention. I would be very happy to answer any questions.